Good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online Lecture 247, Squint and Pediatric Ophthalmology Session 34. And today we have with us Dr. Jyoti Matalia, ma'am, who will be, talk be talking on step-by-step strabismus surgery 2, the complex surgeries and complications. I request Dr. Amitava, sir, to please introduce, ma'am. And then I request Pradeep Sharma, sir, to say a few words, too. Good evening. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure. I can see the, the enormous amount of uh, activities that Dr. Jyoti Matalia has been involved in. She's done her MBBS from the BYL Nair Hospital, Mumbai, a post-graduation from St. G.S. Medical College, KEM Hospital Fellowship Training uh, from L.B. Prasad Eye Institute, Hyderabad, India. So she's done her ICO Fellowship at the Wilma Eye Institute, the U.S., and she's been a volunteer faculty of Orbis International. Uh, to teach and train ophthalmologists in developing countries. She is the head of pediatric ophthalmology, strabismus, and neuro-ophthalmology at Narayana Netrale, uh, Narayana Health City, Bangalore, India, and in charge of postgraduate training at her institute and runs fellowship programs in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus. She's trained more than 30 fellows till date. Her areas of interest include pediatric cataract, neuro-ophthalmology, and te teaching is her passion. She's presented more than 250 lectures at conferences in India and abroad, apart from virtually delivering over 50 lectures in webinars. Award-winning teaching videos have been presented at several national and international conferences like the American Academy of Ophthalmology, the ESCRS, AIOS, and the World Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. She has more than 50 publications in peer-reviewed national and international journals, 10 book chapters, and 10 awards to her credit. Pradeep Sharma, sir, I request you to say a few words too. So, uh, you're on mute, sir. I think it's a real pleasure to have the second part of the talk. We had a wonderful session uh, earlier on the first part by Dr. Jyoti. It was a grand, grand session of several movies and videos on surgeries. And as we say, picture of baki here. So, I think the movie continues and we will have more of such interesting topics and the complications of strabismus surgery. So over to Jyoti, it, please carry on. Yes, thank you so much for the introduction. Yeah, so let's proceed. So my first talk was on the basis of strabismus surgery and this is gonna be on complications. Uh, that is a part two. So before that, let's just brush up our summary of what I did last time. A little bit of the extraocular muscles that we are gonna be tackling in this too. So first is medial rectus, which is the shortest arc of contact and easily lost if it does not have any facial attachments. Lateral rectus, which we know has the longest arc of contact, about 15 millimeters. Inferior oblique lies 10 millimeters away. So be very sure that you don't hook the inferior oblique along with the lateral rectus hooking. But there's also an advantage that is sometimes if you're not able to trace the lateral rectus, you can go by looking at the inferior oblique. So both have these advantages. Superior rectus, facial attachments with the LPS, and superior oblique. So you need to be careful that you release the superior oblique when you are trying to re recess it, which can be accidentally hooked. You also have to release attachments with the LPS because they run through particularly up to the lid so as to avoid ptosis or lid retraction. Inferior rectus, facial attachments with the inferior oblique and the inferior lid retractors have to be kept in mind and have to be completely released to avoid lid retraction. Now, superior oblique, we know, has a broad fan-shaped insertion. Hence, make sure that all the fibers are hooked. Once you hook the superior oblique, turn the globe, you'll see that it entorts. So you are ensuring that the entire muscle is held. Inferior oblique, macula, and the inferotemporal vortex vein is in close proximity with the insertion. So be careful. Sometimes, if you stretch the muscle too much, you can cause injury to the neurovascular bundle, resulting in anisocoria. So let us now look at what are the special procedures that I'll be discussing. First, transposition. Ciliary sparing technique, adjustable suturing, Y split, and I'll discuss a few other surgeries related to DRS, loop myopexy, muscle transplantation, nystagmus when you have to deal it along with squint. So let's start with transposition. Now, muscle transpositions are indicated in paralytic squints in AV patterns for small vertical tropias and torsions. 
So I will be dividing into two parts. One is transposition in AV patterns and the second transposition in paralytic squints. Now in transposition for AV patterns, you can have a vertical transposition of horizontal recti or a horizontal transposition of vertical recti, which have been recommended. Procedure is similar to the recession and resection of recti muscle, except that the muscles are reinserted by shifting half or one full muscle width to get the necessary, require, get necessary effect as per the requirement. The important point here is the muscle should be reinserted parallel to the limbus. So let's, how, let's look at how to manage an A pattern. Superior oblique overaction, you look for it. If it is absent, yes, a vertical displacement of the horizontal recti, which follows the mnemonic of male, where the medial rectus is uh, shifted to the apex and lateral rectus downwards. A half tendon width of the vertical displacement results in 10 to 15 PG of pattern correction, whereas a full tendon width of correction will cause 20 to 25, uh, sorry, full tendon width of displacement will cause 20 to 25 PD of correction. However, if there's a superior oblique overaction, you need to do a superior oblique weakening with the horizontal recti for correcting either the XT or the ET. Remember that if you go do the superior oblique weakening, the more nasal you go, you correct more amount of pattern. That is almost about 15 PD. And if you do temporally, it's about 30, 35, whereas posterior fibers spares the torsion and you can keep the uh, torsion intact in certain cases when you want that. Now, management of V pattern, when you have an inferior oblique overaction, again, the same thing, where it's present or absent. If it is absent, the vertical displacement of the horizontal recti, the same mnemonic that is male, where the medial rectus is shifted towards the apex. And a half tendon width of vertical displacement causes 10 to 15 prism diopters of correction and a full tendon, about 20 to 25. But if you have an inferior oblique overaction, you can do a weakening procedure along with your horizontal muscle surgery. This can correct anything less than 30 PD POF pattern. If the 30 PD of pattern is, I mean, sorry, if the V pattern is more than 30 PD, you need to do simultaneously do the tendon uh, vertical displacement of the horizontal recti. And if you have an associated DVD, you do an inferior oblique anterior transposition. And these surgeries I've already shown in our previous lecture. Now coming to the other aspect that is transposition in paralytic squint. It's performed only after the contraction, the antagonist muscle is released by maximal recession. So you need to understand that directly doing a transposition will not help unless you release this contraction. The commonly performed procedure that I will show is NAPS procedure, that is double elevator palsy, inverse NAPS, that is for double depressor palsy, Hummelsheim's, that is for LR palsy, Jensen's procedure, Nishida, now modified Nishida, which is now commonly done, all for the uh, six nerve palsy, and transposition of superior oblique tendon or MR, MR split to the LR third nerve. So let's look at these transpositions. So here you can see the medial rectus and lateral rectus has shifted along the spiral of Tylox to the superior rectus. This is the NAPS procedure. Uh, the other one is when the MR and LR are shifted to the inferior rectus along the spiral of Tylox. That is an inverse NAPS and that is in double depressor palsy. Now, transposition and paralytic squint could be partial tendon or full tendon. Now, in partial tendon, you can see the superior rectus and inferior rectus are split and you are shifting them along the spiral of Tylox to your lateral rectus. This is the Hummelsheim's. First of all, procedures, the lateral halves are of the SR and LR are inserted to LR through a 180 degrees temporal peritomy, but recurrences are common. The second one, which is done, is Carlson and Jampolsky, which is done as an adjustable procedure. And once you get the notch here, you can actually control and pull them so that the amount of vertical deviation are corrected and you don't get a unnecessary induced vertical direction. The other one is Jensen's, which is no longer used because you're tying a part of your split superior rectus and inferior rectus to the lateral rectus and there's no strength of the lateral rectus. So to be avoided. Now, full tendon, on the other hand, is when you shift the superior rectus and inferior rectus. Remember, when you're operating, do not operate on more than two muscles simultaneously at the same time. So uh, in this, you can see Rosenbaum's where you have induced, can cause induction of vertical deviance, deviation, hence about two to four prism diopters of uh, hypertropia. Uh, it tends to improve, but there is anterior segment ischemia, hence better to give a Botox at the same time. The other one is when you do it along, this, uh, along the spiral of Tylox and you have a foster fixation suture, which is about eight millimeters behind. This, on the other hand, if you can see, is along the longitudinal axis of muscle, but can induce hypertropia. So this is which is now more preferred. It has a better effect. Now let's look at this in animation. So here you can see the half tendon of the superior rectus and inferior rectus is displaced 
and sutured 8 millimeters behind. Whereas here, you can see the entire muscle is displaced and sutured again 8 millimeters, and you see better effect in these surgeries. So let me show you the surgery of transposition of vertebral recta in a patient that we had done. Transposition of the vertical recti. Isolate the superior rectus and split it into half for about 10 to 12 millimeters from its insertion using two small hooks. Place sixovicral sutures in a three fixation technique on the temporal half of the superior rectus muscle and disinsert it. Isolate the inferior rectus, split it in a similar manner for about 10 to 12 millimeters from its insertion and secure the lateral half with sixovicral suture similar to what we have done in the superior rectus muscle. Severe the attachments of the inferior rectus with a lower lid so as to prevent lid retraction when the muscle is disinserted. Secure the lateral ends of the superior rectus and inferior rectus by passing sutures through the sclera such that it lies parallel to the insertion of the lateral rectus. Place Foster's augmented suture 8 mm from the insertion of the lateral rectus through the sclera and through the corresponding ends of the superior rectus and the inferior rectus muscle. Now, few things that you can keep in mind is when you are actually shifting the muscle, you can actually have a 3 mm resection. So, that will add to the effect you get when you are transposed it to the lateral rectus. Also, try to preserve one ciliary artery in the leftover portion so as to prevent the anterior ischemia from developing. So this is a patient who had a six nerve palsy in the right eye preoperatively, and this is after surgery. So the idea is to improve this area of binocular vision. So even post-surgery, if you have a limitation of adduction and abduction, at least the gaze or the amount of degree of binocular vision the patient will have will be good enough for him to do his activity in primary position. Now the Nishita's procedure, which was commonly introduced for lateral rectus palsy, where you see the vertical muscle half. So you have to split the vertical uh, you split the superior and inferior rectus vertically and then displace it, get it as you see here to your lateral rectus about 8 millimeters behind. Right? But now what we tend to do is a modified Nishida procedure where the superior rectus is transposed superolaterally and inferior rectus inferolaterally without splitting. So you use the 5O proline, that is a non absorbable suture through one third of the muscle thickness and that is 8 millimeters behind and get it about 12 millimeters at a ground the limbus. So few things that you have to keep in mind here is try to dis, uh, try to break the attachments of the superior rectus and inferior rectus as way behind. So the muscle becomes increasingly mobile. And the more you go towards the lateral reflex, if a lateral rectus, the more the effect it comes. So if you want to really get a good effect, you can shift it very, very close to your lateral rectus. So this is one animation done for a patient who had a medial rectus recession along with modified nishida. So you can see the medial rectus recessed the eyeball comes a little to the center, but then you get the muscle about 8 millimeters behind and drag it over about 12 millimeters along the limbus to get the effect. So this is done for a patient who would have a significant lateral rectus. So initially we thought that Nishida would not give you that much effect, but yes, if you displace, if you break the attachments very well and pull it as close to the lateral rectus as possible, you can get even more effect. So let me show you a surgery that we did in a patient the modified Nishida's procedure. So as you can see, I have hooked superiorly and hooked the superior rectus muscle. And once you hook the muscle, try to displace it as behind posteriorly. You need to break the attachment with the LPS. Then going and hooking the inferior rectus, again, breaking the attachments. And eight millimeters behind, you take past the suture. You can go about one third, though I have taken only one fourth, one third of the thickness of the muscle width and once you've taken it 12 millimeters behind, exactly if you see, this is 12 millimeters behind, you get it. And as you tie them with a non-absorbable suture, you'll see the muscle being pulled well in, a, in this particular position. The same thing is done for the inferior rectus. You go behind, take a bunch of it, and you need to help by pulling the globe in that direction so that the suture does not break through. And this is going to be 12 millimeters behind where the muscle is nicely got. And at the end, you will see the entire muscle shifting in that direction. So this was done along with the medial rectus recession and hence didn't want too much of an effect. Post-operatively, post the patient was had a very good uh, orthotropia in the primary position. Okay. Now coming to third nerve palsy. This is a patient, as you can see in the right eye, where there's no elevation, no depression, 
uh, only abduction is present with no adduction of minus four. So what can we do in a completely frozen globe? One, one surgery that we have always uh, thought of is split lateral rectus to the MR, where the lateral rectus you can see is split into the superior and inferior halves. And then this is then got uh, under your superior oblique and superior rectus medially, and then inferior rectus and inferior oblique uh, again medially, so that you're finally suturing it close to the globe. Now you need to understand that when you do this, you've totally paralyzed the function of the lateral rectus. It is no longer going to be used. So you can reserve it only when you just want to get the eyes perfectly. And there's absolutely no movement of any other muscle function when you can do this. And uh, you need to be very sure that you get it under the all muscles and getting it properly is very, very important because you need to understand that what we are doing is displacing this muscle completely below almost at, the, at its origin and then getting on the other side to get the maximum effect. So let's see how we've done this Y split of lateral rectus transposition to the medial rectus for a third nerve palsy in the same patient. So first the lateral rectus is hooked and we divide it similarly into two parts and then split them completely. Again, attachments as posteriorly should be separated. This is then passed below the inferior oblique and then inferior rectus and got medially. Take care that you're pulling it backwards so that the tip of the suture of the needle does not injure any other portion. Now I'm hooking the superior rectus muscle and then looking for the superior oblique muscle. So after I've got, you can see the entire fan of the superior oblique and you need to get it below it. So first you notice that I'm going under it, again, pulling it backwards so that the needle tip does not injure the muscle, then going under it. So the right technique, you should know how to go it. Many a times people disinsert the superior oblique and the inferior oblique. Once you've got carefully, you isolate your medial rectus muscle and then along the spiral of Trilox, you suture it this is the superior rectus being sutured. And then the similar pattern, you suture the inferior, uh, inferior half of the lateral rectus. And once you've sutured it, then you try to pass it into one fourth of this junction into your medial rectus muscle and the similar thing on the other side. So that way you've got it as close to get the best effect. So this is a patient pre-operatively and post-operatively, you see the eyes practically almost at the center, cosmetically very good. But note, there'll be no movement. You cannot do much changes. Yes, you can even plan doing this on adjustable, but it is like one position. There'll be no motility whatsoever after the surgery. So just to summarize the various transpositions, the vertical transposition of horizontal recti, horizontal transposition of vertical recti, slanting of recti muscles are kept for all uh, A and V patterns without associated oblique muscle dysfunction. The transplantation of muscles in paralytic could be, as mentioned, Hummelsheim's, Naps, inverse Naps, Jensen's, and Nishida's. So now to the next uh, important procedure, ciliary sparing technique. So when would you do that? When more than two muscle surgery, mus two recti muscles are operated, prefer not to do that. But in case it is inevitable, then you can plan doing this because there's a high risk of ischemia, especially in those which have systemic disorders. So idea is to prevent the anterior segment ischemia. So let's look about how to do it. Ciliary sparing technique. After hooking the muscle, dissect the ciliary vessels using a blunt forceps and scissors, separating it from the muscle up to the insertion. This technique is preferred when more than two recti are operated upon, especially when the patient has high risk for anterior segment ischemia. Hook the muscle below the vessels and the rest of the surgery is completed as usual ensuring minimal manipulation on the vessels. So sometimes you can actually take a bunch of the muscle fibers as well when you're doing this technique. Also remember that uh, even if you feel you've done a ciliary vessel sparing, you cannot 100% guarantee that it will stay. Over time, you can still have a risk. So as mentioned earlier, try to avoid it as much as possible doing more than two muscles in the same sitting. Now coming to the third important procedure, adjustable sutures. Now, adjustable suture technique allows fine tuning of ocular movements in the immediate post-operative period. It facilitates more accurate ocular alignment and decreases the need for re-operations. It's performed in two stages. First stage is either GA or LA. Whatever you do, recessed or resected muscle is sutured just like just the, such that the sutures can be made loose and the muscle recession or resection can be varied. Second stage is readjustment, which is made within 24 hours of the first surgery and the in local or topical anesthesia. So indications are restricted to strabismus like Graves disease, scleral buckle or anesthetic myotoxicity. So conditions where we are not really uh, sure about the outcome, the pre 
predictability is difficult and hence we would like to do adjustable suturing. Any cases with previous trauma or surgery, incompetent deviations like Duane's, Mobius syndrome, myasthenia or paralytic, paralytic strabismus, any long-standing complex strabismus, any patient who can cooperate. So that is very important. First, what is the indication? Where would you do it? Because you don't know if your outcome may vary and you want to uh, do it, maybe multiple surgeries. And this time you want to give him a last outcome, uh, last chance. So you would want to do an adjustable. And, but he should be able to cooperate. That is very, very important. And you can do it in your OPD, especially for an older child. If he's allowing you to do AT in the room and he lets you touch your, uh, you know, the conjunctiva with a, a bud after anesthetic. If he is comfortable, you know this person will allow you to adjust post surgery. So, what are the two techniques? First is bow tie technique. After scleral pass, the sutures are attached to the muscle pole, tied as shown using a bow tie as with a shoelace. During adjustment, the bow is untied, the muscle position is adjusted. So, prior to doing that, you would have checked him in OPD, see amount of deviation, whether you want to undo it or do more. And on that basis, the bow is untied, the muscle position is adjusted and retied. Once the desired alignment is obtained, then you cut the bow and convert it into a square knot. The other one is a sliding noose technique. The pole sutures are positioned to emerge from the scleral tunnel, which are about one millimeter apart, with the ends secured to each other with an overhand uh, knot. Noose is then created by tying a separate piece of suture around the pole sutures with a square knot. And manipulation of the noose is done so that it slides over this particular two ends, and that way adjustment can be timed. Once uh, the secure the pole sutures to each other with a permanent square knot and trim the noose. That is the after your adjustment has been done. So I will just show a case of bow tie adjustment that we have done in a patient. Adjustable suture technique. This slide demonstrates the diplopia and hesis charting of a patient who had a right lateral rectus muscle palsy. Patient was treated with injection Botox 5 international units in the right medial rectus muscle, which over a period of one year showed improvement in the esotropia and also abduction. Pre-operative cover test here showed right esotropia measuring 18 prism diopters of base out, for which the patient underwent right medial rectus recession on a bow tie adjustable suturing under topical anesthesia. On table, cover test done shows residual esotropia confirmed subjectively with red filter test. Therefore, the suture was readjusted and a further recession of right medial rectus was performed. Post operative cover test here shows patient being orthotropic. So in this particular case, since there was a small amount of uh, esotropia and the patient was pretty cooperative, I did it under topical anesthesia. But again, as I said previously also, topical anesthesia is when you are comfortable and you feel the patient is comfortable. Otherwise, it may not be necessary for a surgeon to put uh, himself under stress to do it. But this was a quick surgery and we could get the desired result. Hence, the adjustment was just immediately after doing the technique. Now, the next procedure is Y-split. Now, it is known to improve up up and down shoots. It removes it from the crest of the globe and theoretically eliminates the lateral rectus slippage this, that causes the upshoot and the downshoot. So indicated for Duane syndrome, splitting the muscle from its insertion as far posteriorly about 14 to 16 millimeters and spreading the muscle hubs anywhere between one to two muscle width above and below the original insertion at the desired point. So let's look at this child who had left DRS with upshoot up, uh, Just one minute, I'm just waiting for the video to play. Yeah, so if you can see there is limit in the left eye, there's a limitation of abduction of almost minus four. And as you see the eye coming to the right, that is in the position of adduction, you see that the eye, the globe literally just totally disappears completely, which is like the almost four amount of uh, upshoot. And this is a classical pumpkin seed sign. So it literally disappears from your view the minute when he looks to the in adduction. So for that, obviously, wide split of recession is needed because he didn't have much deviation in primary position, only a split 
is what you can do. But in case you are splitting it more than two width diameters that are almost 20 millimeters apart, a small amount of recession will also help. Otherwise, trying to uh, stitch them about, I mean, sorry, time them to uh, suture them so wide apart can cause more tightening. Hence, a small recession is. Why split of the lateral rectus with recession? Isolate and expose the lateral rectus muscle. Split it into two halves using two small hooks. For a distance of 14 to 16 millimeters posteriorly from its insertion using two small hooks. Place six ovicral sutures through both the upper and the lower halves of the split muscle at its insertion. This is done in a three fixation technique. Disinsert the two halves. For a six millimeter of recession, the markings are done as shown. Each half of the muscle is secured to the sclera above and below forming a Y such that the two arms of Y are separated at one muscle width distance. This was initial surgeries, but now I prefer to do about 20 millimeters beyond at least two width technique. So this is a patient post operatively. You can see that the uh, upshoot is almost disappeared. There's limitation of adduction about minus one, but his upshoot, upshift, upshoot is completely gone. Now looking at one more case of uh, DRS, an exotropic DRS done already operated for surgery. You can see he had a right face turn and an exotropia. No changes are noted in the ocular motility with an adduction of minus four and abduction of minus two in all the different gazes. Now, this case was a patient who was already operated where he had undergone a LR recession of nine millimeters with Y splitting. An MR resection was done of six millimeter on an adjustable and eventually recessed to six millimeters. So this was done for his medial rectus and lateral rectus had a Y split. If you look at his old photographs, he had the same face turn right from childhood with no changes, indicating that, yes, uh, with significant uh, globe retraction and narrowing, indicating that this was an DRS with an abnormalous, anomalous LR function. Hence, needing what we would prefer is disinserting the lateral rectus and putting it on a vital wall so as to remove, totally remove the function of the lateral rectus. So I will now show you how it is. Now, importantly, what we need to understand, this patient has already undergone surgery. If it's a fresh muscle, yes, easier to pass and then disinsert it and putting on a, a lateral orbital ball. But this is a case where already being operated. So I will just show you the difficulties that come in when you're doing resurgeries and how did we manage this. So first and foremost, we realized on table, yes, an FDT, very important. You see the eye is already exotropic. And you see when you're trying to move it, there's so much tightening in your lateral rectus. So we did a limbal incision because we had to find those two recessed edges, which were uh, nine, uh, which were almost nine millimeters behind and almost one bit apart. So as you see, I picked up something and realized this is so close to the rimbus. So this is basically a pseudo tendon. Use a traction suture as mentioned because we need to really uh, shift the globe as behind. Then going way behind, we could be able to hook the superior lateral rectus, the superior band that is the LR band. And then sutured that with difficulty because you can see it's way behind, followed by its disinsertion. Similarly, we could find the inferior band as well. But before that, I'm checking there are no attachments of this particular band. Then the inferior LR is also sutured and disinserted, as you can see. Since they were wide apart, I totally then tied them together into one thing. Then came the important lateral periosteal fixation. First, locate the lateral orbital rim. And now you want to go below it so that you want this muscle to fall behind. So using a fiber proline suture, you pass it through your periosteum. And now when you pull up, you'll see that it is so much into the periosteum, otherwise you don't see it moving. Then those two tight LR bands, I'm trying to break all the adhesions because we don't want it to again develop. And you can see the adhesions are way behind. Once it's totally cleared, then the fiber proline is passed through this particular tight LR bands. And these LR bands were more like a fibrous bands, not like the normal muscle that you see. So these were together tied. That way you are anchoring the LR onto the uh, periosteum and then the uh, tenons is also sutured over it. And finally, the conjunctiva, uh, so that you can see here that it is perfectly closed. So this is how we managed. Final outcome, you can see the patient had a fully corrected head posture. Uh, orthotropia for distance, but a small XT for near, probably because he had already been operated for his uh, medial rectus. So this is how he was and the patient was happy at the end. Now, coming to the next procedure, that is loop myopexy. Now, loop myopexy, we know, is reserved for strabismus fixes, presence of esotropia with hypertropia, with restricted abduction and supraadduction, superior temporally, the protrusion of the elongated eye globe through the muscle cone results in what we get, the esotropia and hypertropia. 
and there's an inferior displacement of the lateral rectus and a nasal displacement of the superior rectus muscle. What we need to do is get them together. So this is what exactly happens. Because of the heavy globe, you see it goes away and we need to get the superior rectus and the lateral uh, lateral together. That is the concept and principle of loop myopexy. So what are the various options that you can do? Yes, the various procedures that have been described are uh, Yokoyama's procedure where a full loop myopexy of the superior rectus and lateral rectus muscle belly with polyester suture is done. The Yamada's procedure where hemi-transposition of the superior rectus and lateral rectus with a combined large MR recession. Partial Jensen's is splitting of the superior rectus and lateral rectus up to post equator and opposition of the adjacent halves and modification of the silicon band where you use a, a full loop myopexy of the superior rectus and lateral rectus muscle belly with a silicon band. You can also use uh, the silicon rod that is used for your tarsofrontal sling. So I'll be showing you each of this technique that we did. The first loop myopexy with Dacron sutures. As you can see here, the superior rectus is hooked and the lateral rectus with the sutures. After you've hooked there, we measure way behind. So we want about 15 millimeters behind where they are tied. You hold the knot and you do it. So the disadvantage here is yes, muscle strangulation that can occur, but try to measure it as behind as possible, about 15 millimeters. The next is loop myopexy with silicon rod. So here a scleral pocket is made in the superotemporal quadrant of the left eye. After you made the pocket, the silicon rod is passed in it uh, from one side. You are feeding it on one side and pulling it in this direction. You can see through the needle, you're pulling the rod inside. And then that is the lateral rectus, which is passed in the lateral rectus. Then it is passed into the superior rectus. And then both of this are put into the Svatske sleeve on either side. You have to check which side you're putting what. So accordingly, you know what to pull. You need to understand you don't have to pull them so much together enough that they come into their fields. You don't need to really have them joined together. So this is the lateral rectus and superior rectus using the silicon rod. And here you need to then cut, trim the edges and bury it. Then here is loop myopexy with silicon band, which is what most of the people tend to do. Again, a scleral pocket is made, but here you need to make a bigger pocket, but you need to pass the silicon number 240 band. As you can see, you're passing it. Once you pass through it, then you pass it around your muscles, both the muscles, and then the similar thing through the Vatske sleeve, trim the edges, try to prevent it having any sharp edges, try to use even the tenon sheet to cover it. So advantages prevents, prevents anterior segment ischemia and it's a reversible procedure. Disadvantages, yes, foreign body granuloma and extrusion can occur. So try to put it behind, try to have co cover it with the tenons capsule. Uh, and reversible is that when you want to remove it, you just cut it off and there's an entire capsule that develops around it. You just cut it off and remove the capsule and this can be easily pulled off. Then this is another thing that we did, the loop uh, myopexy modification without muscle split. Now, this was an interesting case of a child who was five-year-old who came with a very, very large um, hypotropia with uh, esotropia and it was developing since one year of his life. And this is what we notice on table. So I will just take you through the video. So if you see, we first hooked, uh, tried to hook the inferior, uh, the lateral rectus, but you see how inferiorly it was displaced. In fact, the lateral rectus was parallel to the inferior rectus. And you see normally IO is at the lower part of the lateral rectus and see how where it is here. The lateral rectus is way below. Then when we try to hook the superior rec uh, rectus, you realize it's in line with your superior oblique. It was so significantly displaced. That means about 270 degrees of both these muscles were displaced here. So then we measure about 15 millimeters behind. Then I pass the suture through the uh, superior half of the lateral rectus with a fiber dacron. So basically it didn't split it, but only just like we do nishidas in the similar way, just pass the sutures, got the muscle. So that caused the muscle to come up because you're passing sutures through it. And then secure the lateral half of the superior rectus with the fiber dacron suture. So got both the sutures together. So this allowed caused playing of the lateral rectus and superior rectus superotemporally. So it got both your muscles in the proper position and then I tied it. So basically had a looped LR and SR about 15 millimeters behind, which gave the uh, uh, effect. So it prevented strangulation of the muscles, reduced the risk of scleral perforation, and you had it measured at a right distance. So the advantages now the lateral rectus, which was displaced inferiorly and superior rectus nasally was got together just by getting this partial edge of these muscles together. So this patient did very well post-operatively and is fine till now. Now, what other thing I did was that in that I had done a medial rectus recession prior which should have been avoided. When you see uh, somebody having so much displacement, it's pure loop myopexy can get you the effect. 
So we had to undo the MR recession, get it back to its normal. And then he was orthotropic for the, the last four years that we are seeing him. Now the other procedure is muscle transplantation. A simple technique where a muscle stump is added to a recess resect procedure. It's indicated for large angles, started with esotropia, because in esotropia, you are going to be resecting the lateral rectus. So you have a bigger chunk, but it is also can be done for exotropias for anything more than 65 PD or even residual squints, which are already been operated, where you need to add a little bit of stump when you're doing a resection to get a desired effect. So advantage surgery is done only on two muscles, that is in one eye. It's a satisfactory alignment with no lateral incompetence and no limitation of movements and better than hang back. So no scope for the muscle to creep forward. This is a patient with 70, uh, 70 PD extreme right eye and one by 60 vision. So what we did it, yes, we basically did a part of the medial rectus where we were resecting was removed and then attached to the lateral rectus and then it was recessed behind. So let me show you the video. So here we can see that the patient had, we have hooked to the lateral rectus, passed sutures through it and uh, kept it aside. I mean, basically disinserted and kept. Now this is the uh, muscle that is medial rectus that we are resecting. We've gone behind as I do the three point uh, fixation technique. That is uh, with the, and then pass the muscle at its insertion, cut it in position. So this was about 6.5 millimeters of recession, uh, sorry, resection. So what eventually stump I got was only four millimeters, but I separated this. Then this particular stump was then got into the side of the lateral rectus. I'm disinserting the lateral rectus now. And I've passed the particular recesses to what my position I wanted. Then I've passed the particular stump to it. Once I've passed it, the remaining, the lower portion is then tied to the lateral rectus. And then I have tied it up finally. So you can see a four millimeter of effect I've got after suturing the lateral rectus recession with the stump. And here the medial rectus is then resected in position. So this was the patient pre-operatively and post-operatively, you see that the eye is pretty aligned by operating on one amblyogenic eye. So this is a nice table which was put in JAPOS 2018 where the amount of esotropia XT you have, how much to do a resection, how much to do a recession and how much to transplant. But you remember that whatever you cut, the amount will obviously shrink by about two to 2.5 millimeters. And finally, the special procedure that I'll discuss is nystagmus. Uh, these are the various uh, correction surgeries that can be done. Primarily is Kestenborg, where the head turn, you do bilaterally five millimeters recess, resect of horizontal recti. I prefer the augmented Anderson, where for head turn, this is about less than 30 degrees. You can do yoke muscle recession, that is MR uh, by nine millimeters and LR by 12 millimeters. If it's more than uh, 30, obviously, we would can go for the augmented procedure. But the advantage of doing yoke muscle is later on, if I want to do, I can do bilat, uh, like the yoke muscle resections to get the effect. The classical parks is head turn up to 30 degrees, do the 5, 6, 7, 8 rule. You can do augmented Keston bomb that is classic plus, where head turn is more than 30 degrees. So you have to augmentation of 40% and 60% respectively over this particular measurements. So as to get the effect, vertical Keston bomb or parks is chin elevation or chin depression, bilateral recess resect of the SR and IR. And torsional Keston bombs is nystagmus with head tilt due to superior oblique and inferior oblique surgery. So what happens when you have a nystagmus with strabismus? It's a left face turn with left esotropia. You can see a significant esotropia in this eye. So what you would do, you would operate on the fixing eye for doing the nystagmus surgery and on the amblyopic eye or the eye which is having the squint, you will do your squint measurements. That is a squint surgery, the recess resect. So in this case, because it, uh, head turn was less than 30 degrees, I did only the right eye surgery where I did about 12 millimeters of LR recession and the left eye, I did the strabismus surgery where the recession was done. So you can see the patient is fine, is orthotropic and the squint is also corrected. Without the glasses, you can see that. So this is how you would manage a nystagmus along with a squint. So now let's go to the next topic is complication of strabismic surgery. We should understand that no surgery is without complication and even strabismus is no exception. So I'll be taking into the commonest ones because there can be so many of them, important and commonest ones. And I'll be trying to explain in terms of the recognition, the management and the prevention. Now complication of strabismus surgery is divided. What I would like to divide is surgical site related or alignment related. Now surgical site could be intraoperatively and postoperatively. In case of the intraoperative complications, commonest is scleral perforation, which could be as high as 8%. It's due to inadvertent deep pass during muscle reinsertion or even while taking the securing suturing bites into the sclera 
uh, no, into the while cutting the sutures, securing the sutures before it is insertion. So always lift your muscle when you're doing it. The risk factors are high myopia, resurgery, scarring, post scleral buckling, high chances at the site of insertion of muscle, that is the thinnest point of the sclera, or during posterior, that is retro equatorial fixation. So how would you manage? First, recognize it. Sudden giveaway is given. Suture needle not visible through the sclera, vitreous and iris pigment uh, extrusion, and vitreous hemorrhage at the site, and a chorioretinal atrophy, if you can see post-operatively, if you have a doubt. Management, yes, dilate the fundus. Sometimes you can do it intraoperatively. Uh, after you have done that, stop it. Go put drop, dilating drops and check it. Laser retinopexy can be done in the OPD, but cryopexy can be done intraoperatively. Uh, monitor closely for, a de for decrease in vision and RD. Prevention, good exposure is required. A spatulated needle, which we commonly use, when pass very slowly and steadily. Needle tip should be visible at all times. Try to keep your field comfortable so that there is no jerk, your speculum or your other instruments do not hit it and observe each step of it till you finally come out. The next is lost muscle. This is a dreaded complication and I think none of us would ever want to have that. Uh, disinterred muscle slips free of sutures and instruments. Muscle along with capsule retracts into the globe. Pulled in two syndrome, loss of the muscle at the junction of the belly and the tendon. And risk factors is MR and IR because they have a shorter arc of contact and mostly MR because there is no attachments to him. So you have to be very, very careful. So recognition, intraoperatively sudden slippage from sutures, post-operatively incompetent strabismus, large deviation, uh, limitation of movement is not. And then suddenly a patient may be doing fine and post-operatively suddenly worsened after a day or two, you can suspect that to happen. Management, first and foremost, please do not panic. The minute you have it, you need to stay calm because if you are calm, you'll be able to tackle this. Uh, treat it as an emergency and intraoperatively try to retrieve the muscles by exploring through the tenon space. First, imagine that your uh, medial rectus of your right eye, you feel a slip. Rather than abducting the globe, abduct the globe. Try to look into the field because the minute you abduct it, the muscle is completely going to go back into its sheet. So turn it in the direction of your medial rectus. Slowly, slowly try to look for this attachment and go and find your muscle. Later on, you can use the MRI and even ASOCT to determine its position. And resurgery should be done before additions develop. Prevention, yes, gentle maneuvers. Do not pull very tight muscles. Be very gentle. Sometimes certain instruments which are very fine or sharp can actually cut through. So be very careful when your assistant is holding and when you're passing sutures. And always remember that when you are, if your suture gives way, try to go full thickness into your muscle. You do not want the muscle bite. So going partial thickness, you can go full thickness, but go at different places so that the entire muscle chunk is being held. Then slipped muscle, muscle belly retracts within the muscle capsule due to ineffective securing, more common with MR, risk factors is tight muscle. Recognize intraoperatively sudden slippage from sutures. Again, the same thing postoperatively, look for incompetent strabismus, large deviation, limitation of movements. Um, locate muscle capsule attached to the globe and follow the capsule posteriorly and find the muscle fibers and secure. So many a times, as I showed the previous thing, surgery where I saw the pseudo tendon, you will see a pinkish appearance that's seen and look for the reddish muscle fibers which are there and try to grasp it at that position. Prevention, use full thickness bites. You can have it at multiple locations, but they are important so that the partial fibers do not sp uh, slip and use grooved hooks or muscle clamps. A post-operative complication, commonest being Delin, as you can see here, shallow, clearly defined excavation at the margin of the cornea due to disruption of the tear layers causing dehydration. Risk factors is limbal incision and large resections. Uh, recognition, pers persistent foreign body sensation, pooling of fluorescein uh, within indentation. Management is aggressive lubrication, surgery to remove scar tissue and smoothening conjunctival surface if need be. And prevention is phonix incision, conjunctival recession can be done or you can do paralimbal, don't go really very close to it. Sometimes what happens is the patient may get some amount of chemosis and that also can actually bulge out over time. So to ensure that when the patient closes, closes the eye completely. Then other common ones, uh, not very common, uncommon ones, but very scary as anterior segment ischemia, where there's an interrupted blood flow from the ciliary vessel of recti to anterior chamber due to surgeries on three or more muscles in one eye. 
It's one in 13,000 cases, but can occur at any time post-operatively. Just like we don't want to slip muscle, we would not want to have an anterior segment ischemia. So even if you feel today in a young patient, you would want to do muscle, uh, three or more muscle surgery, it's not a good option because over time, he could even get, develop it 10 years down the line. So it's important. So risk factors, therefore, look for multiple muscle surgeries, previous surgeries, systemic ischemic factors, very, very important. So you have to look for them before you plan to do anything more than two muscles. Recognition, corneal edema, iritis, DM folds, necrosis, decreased vision, sluggish pupil, uh, thysis bulba and iris angiogram. But in Indian eyes, it's a little difficult because of the dark color of the iris. Management, topical and systemic steroids to be given and collateral vessels may develop. How do you prevent not more than two muscles in one eye in one sitting? Stage procedures for large deviation or complex strabismus. At least wait for four to six months before you go ahead. And addition, do ciliary vessel sparing technique. Then fat adherence syndrome, fibro fatty scar adhered to the globe in causing restriction of movements. It is seen due to prolapse of the orbital fat and bleeding into it is most important. So not just the fat prolapse, but when it bleeds, it causes these additions. Risk factors are posterior dissection, operating mostly on inferior oblique and inferior rectus because there's a lot of posterior tenons there and a lot of uh, fat that can prolapse. Uh, retrieval of lost muscle, if you're doing, you can again develop the same thing. Recognize the scarring and restriction of extraocular muscle. And therefore, a good history will tell you that, okay, this patient had a chance because he underwent so many surgeries or had this kind of thing. So if you have a fat prolapse and you have a bleeding, please document it so that subsequently you would know what has caused the fat adherence. Management surgery to expose and release the additions, conjunctival recession, but high recurrence rates are also seen. Prevention not to violate the retro orbital fat, suture posterior tenons in layers like what I did it in the patient where we fix it on the lateral orbital wall and ciliary vessel sparing technique. Trans other common conditions are transient changes in refractive allomosic astigmatism. I've seen it in patients with DRS where they had this really tightened globe. Once you release the pressure and the retraction comes down, they may have these changes that show up. Alteration in palp palpable fissure, which is lid retraction and ptosis, which are common when you are tackling the superior rectus and inferior rectus, hence very important to break the additions with the surrounding tissues, that is the LPS for the superior rectus and the uh, lid uh, retractors and the IR. Suture reactions that can come in, persistent congestions, conjunctival scarring, granuloma inclusion cyst, which may require surgery. You can give a course of steroids, the subsequent surgery may be needed over time. Necroiz necrotizing scleritis, which is also an emergency, important to rule out, but sometimes you should be able to differentiate in the early stages from a gaping of a wound. Sometimes the wound may just gape, so be sure and not to assume a necrotizing scleritis as a gaping. So be sure of what you have. Take help from your cornea colleagues in case you have any doubt. And post-operatively infections. Now coming to the other part of the complication in strabismus, that is the alignment related, and that's something that bothers us most. Uh, the undercorrection, the overcorrection, the diplopia, and the muscle restriction. Now, under correction or over correction, the most common complication, 20% it is seen. It can occur in the early post-operative post period or later, more in intermittent diversion squint or sensory strabismus. Risk factors are poor fusion potential, neurodevelopmental abnormalities, which can be there. Hence, you need to plan what you want to do. So recognize cover test should be done at every post-operative visit. Management exercises to enhance fusional mechanisms, prism glasses for smaller deviations, over minus therapy for IDS. If the patient is hyperopic, you can give hyperopic glasses if there's a residual esotropia and resurgeries after waiting for at least six to eight weeks before you take a call. Prevention, careful meticulous planning, and hence it's very, very important that you don't hurry and go for surgery. At least two consecutive measurements have to be taken that match uh, and at least a month apart, and then you can plan surgeries. Setting and explaining realistic goals is very important. And telling the patient really, like in an intermittent uh, diversion squint, when we know that the success rate is only 75 to 80%, we need to really tell the patient so they are aware what can be done and what can be expected. Then diplopia can be temporarily till fusional mechanisms develop. 9% show temporary uh, diplopia and less than 1% can have intractable diplopia. Not seen in cases of sensory strabismus due to poor vision, but in patients with adults, complicated or torsional strabismus, you can actually have that. So recognize sensory and motor evaluation post-surgery is very important. Uh, management, reassure the patient. It can resolve within six weeks. Sometimes you may need to give him prism glasses or monocular occlusion for interim period. 
orthoptic evaluation can be done followed by exercises of different kinds and resurgery in intractable cases can also be tried. Prevention, yes, careful assessment preoperatively. So you need to really check what it is to assess for diplopia by neural, by, with neutralizing prisms preoperatively whenever you feel that there's a doubt and adjustable suturing technique. So with this, I complete my uh, surgical, uh, all the possible surgeries that I could show in uh, strabismus and complications. And we can take questions and discussion further. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, that was definitely a treat to the eyes. And like, uh, at least I have not seen all the varieties of surgeries. So I, or strabismus surgery specifically. So I enjoyed a lot. Uh, so Pradeep, sir, would you like to say something? I think it was really, really uh, encyclopedic exposition of strabismus surgery, I should say. Uh, both Thank the you. parts, the first part and the second part has covered up uh, almost everything that one would like to see in, a, uh, in the management of strabismus. So really hats off to Dr. Jyoti for doing it. Uh, it was a short time in two hours to do all that much is really, mm -hmm. really very much, uh, uh, in, I mean, phenomenal. Thank so you. really wonderful job. So if there are any questions, first we may have because we may be otherwise... Uh, Miss, we have short mm -hmm. time, so let's see if there are any questions. And Dr. Amitava, yes, Dr. Amitava, would you like to comment, so please? So there's nothing to say. It was an exceptional presentation, uh, very lucid and very clear. Thank you. And ma'am, from the presentations, one can make out how much you love to teach. Every single <laughs> step you. was very explicitly uh -huh. told and, you know, clarified that this is how it is. And this is and views, I think they were really good, were wonderful. Right. Uh, there are a few questions that uh, while hooking the recti, how do we ascertain whether the entire muscle is hooked or partially it has been taken? Yeah, so when you basically hook a muscle, you have to ensure that the tip of the hook should be completely coming up to your limbus. So when you hook there, that is what we call as a pole test. So the tip should completely reach your limbus, indicating that you have reached it. That is when you're doing a fornix incision. If you're doing a limbal incision, you will be able to see both the ends. So easily you will be able to make out that the muscle is held. So in addition, there is also that two hook uh, maneuver of uh, described by Krishna. So in which you can, uh, once you are doubtful, then you put two hooks at the end of the other part. And then you'll see really that if sometimes you have missed some fibers in your hook. Uh, but what Dr. Jyoti is saying, in initially when doing a blind hook, you should ensure that the tip of the hook should uh, come and touch the limbus. So that's first thing. But once you have unearthed and then you put another hook at the other pole and see that yes, there are really all the fibers are in and it can happen. So it should be very, very careful. Otherwise you'll have more bleeding and the sheath rupture may be there. And especially in case of fornix. So the other thing is once you hook the muscle, you would actually check at the other end, whether the edge of the muscle is completely come, the inserted insertion is completely there at the other edge or not. Yeah. So, so what you check. Hooks, you can do that. Yeah. Hmm. Right. And ma'am, uh, this, this is a question, in fact, to all three of you, that while doing strabismus surgeries, uh, like the surgeon knows that they might have to go inside again and maybe in future uh, have to redo a surgery, like, you know, the possibility is always there. What steps should be kept, what things should be kept in mind while doing the surgery to make sure that you're preventing adhesions? Preventing aggressions. To Addition. preventing adhesions. Oh, preventing adhesions. So basically try to operate in the field that you want. Don't try to dissect too much. Now in certain conditions, like if you are looking at transposition, you want more dissection because you want the entire muscle to shift. But in normal recess, detect, just open up whatever is needed. Don't have to do too much. Don't try to dissect or cut too much beyond what is required for the field so that you can maintain it. And frankly speaking, when I'm operating, I hope I don't have to go in again. That is my aim. That's why I don't, I mean, you feel that we would want to know. I would not want to. So my first surgery, I always believe should be my last surgery. Pradeep sir, Amitavis, sir, would you like to say anything? So I think as she had mentioned in the surgical steps, one is that you should be working in one plane. That is a subtenant space. <laughs> That's important because if you are working in the subtenant space, you will not have uh, the adhesions form. Secondly, the rupture of the sheath should be avoided because whenever there's a bleeding, chances of adhesions come in. When there is a sheath rupture, that will happen. Uh, so the, uh, I mean, and then third, everything has to be very precise movements. No, 
uh, I mean, untoward movement, you don't use blunt dissection. You should use the uh, precision under the microscope and cut the uh, intermuscular septum with your scissors of amount that you want, eight to 10 millimeters, or maybe in some situations as you want to shift transposition, maybe 20 millimeters separation. So that should be done. Mostly you should avoid splitting of the muscles unless you really want it like you do the split lateral rectus. In that case, of course, there might be some bleeding also. But in that also, you should take care that you split it along the normal course of the muscle fibers. So rather than mm -hmm. doing that, allow the muscle to split with the two hooks. As I think Dr. Jyoti had shown in one of the mm -hmm. videos, that you can use the two hooks to see that there is a separation along the nat natural cleavage of the muscle fibers. So these are the thing, and working under the microscope with a good illumination will take care that you do not create adhesions. Uh, another thing I would like to say for re-surgeries particularly, please make the notations of what surgery you're doing. Because what you want to hand over to another surgeon, if he has to, you should give him actually what muscles you have done, how many millimeters of muscles you have recessed or resected. Many a times that information is missing. So we should always keep a note of that. And of course, if there is any untoward complication intraoperatively, that should be also recorded. Right, sir. Those are very good tips, sir. Thank you. Uh, Amitabha, sir, would you like to mention anything? No, no. I, mean, I think it's been covered. So it's basically, the first surgery itself should be very deliberate and carefully planned surgery. The less you do unnecessary disturbance, less likely you get adhesion. More comfortable will be a subsequent surgery. And of course, like uh, Professor Pradeep Sharma pointed out, it's very important if you know exactly what somebody else has done or even what you had done before if some, somebody comes back to you. So notes are very important. Yeah, I think just to add the documentation is so important because your complication can go to somebody else and somebody else can come to you. So yeah. you, we should be more sensitive about what we are doing right, everything, so that that person knows exactly what we did. So that when you get somebody, you would also want the same, uh, you know, kind of reciprocating the same thing. So just mention it because finally it's just this small group of subismologists and it's going to go to one or the other. So best is to be very transparent of what you've done and mention everything. Right, right. And one more uh, tip to the postgraduates, like even when you all go further, always remember that the primary surgeon has the first say. So in case you ever get a patient who's referred to you after the primary surgeon, it's best to always communicate with the primary surgeon to know about the notes in case they are not available with the patients. It's always important to know what went different with the natural anatomy before you go in again, right? So uh, another question is, how do we manage the fat adhesion following a prior surgical correction? The fat adhesion, uh, I, I guess the... Uh, the person needs to ask is like the if with the muscle the fat is attached. So you're talking about re-surgeries because usually many yeah. times when you're doing some normal surgeries also you can get some sort of fat mm -hmm. uh, protruding uh, sometimes an infiltration of fat in your muscles when you are even operating a routine case. But yes, if you have disturbed the fat too much as such there's no issue. But as I said, if you there's a bleeding that occurs in the fat is what you should document in your file. So that subsequently, if this patient lands up with, suppose you've done an inferior oblique recession and post-operatively you're getting some similar kind of an effect, the eye is not elevating an adduction, you need to know that, okay, this is what I did and that one table, I had this issue so that you are aware. Now, many a times you will have to go and disinsert and redo the surgery. I have not really thought of using mitomycin. I would like to know if Dr. Sharma has used in those patients, whether basically to avoid this from happening again would be to get a good dissection and probably use mitomycin C so that you don't get that effect again. So I just wanted to know your opinion. Yeah, I think we have used mitomycin C and we have, I think, published that in JPO some, uh, maybe in 2004 or something, that in cases of restrictive strabismus, which mm -hmm. may be because of uh, fat adhesions or other fibrosis, which may be there. So one is when you are dissecting it, uh, one tip would be to use usually a limbal incision so that you have a clear picture of what you will find. Uh, and then you expose the muscle, all the intramuscular septum and the uh, other adhesions and make sure that intraoperative FDT is done uh, time and again so that you are getting a free uh, FDT uh, finally. And after that, you can apply mitomycin C, uh, which will take care of the adhesion formation. And that we found that it works for about a month, the effect of that. And after a month, I mean, uh, if something is going to happen, if there is a chance, then and also using of steroids. I mean, that would be another thing that you would have to use topical steroids little more in such cases in which you are expecting a 
uh, adhesion formation or post-inflammatory reaction. So if you have had a lot of bleeding and all, if you suspect that, you may use steroids, even if you have not used mitomycin C post-operatively. Right. Um, another question is that, can you please explain the three-point uh, fixation suture in securing the muscle? Yeah, so basically what I do is I pass from the lateral end, come to the junction of two-third with one-third, take the central, loop it again, take it again into the central. So I have a central uh, uh, looping done. In fact, there's an article, I have written a uh, commentary for one of the papers in IGO and I'll pass it on to you where I've actually described the technique. So the central one gets looped and then there are two coming at the other end. These are doubly locked at the two ends. So that's why the central one is the one that is passed. So I would pass from partial, I mean, from the periphery, get out in the middle, loop the middle one third twice, get it to the other end. Now you have two at the other ends and then take total locking sutures at both the ends. So that's why middle two is secured and the lateral two is locked. So that way you have a three point fixation. The same thing in case of a resection, I would take from the middle and tie it to form a knot in the middle one third and then take the locking sutures on the either sides. So you can take either partial with um, uh, uh, full thickness locking at the ends or two uh, full thickness lockings at both the ends. Right, ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, how often do we perform a central genotomy for four to five adapters of uh, hypertrophic correction? Yeah, there is, uh, I had attended one conference where they have shown that a central genotomy can work for four to five small amount of squint, but I have not had any personal experience of mine. Dr. Sharma, have you tried it? No, these mini genotomies, I also have not done. I have done at the, uh, at the periphery, not the central yes. genotomies. At the yeah. periphery, I mean, at the two poles, uh, we have uh, at the end of the surgery, if you find that there is uh, the FDT is little tight or the uh, deviation is not up to the mark that you want, then you can do um, a minute not me. Uh, this I learned from Dr. Reniki. I mean, he said that he would do that. And under uh, many a times, if you're working under the uh, anesth local anesthesia or to topical anesthesia, this may be very handy that you know that the deviations are not fully corrected. You can do a peripheral tenotomies. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the central mini tenotomies, I haven't uh, seen. I don't really feel very happy that it will be working as much because mm. major part of the attachment of the muscle are still going to be there. So I don't know how much effect comes and how long it lasts. So yeah. I've not done it for resurgeries, but yes, if there's a small one and like a small cut the muscle at the edge, periphery, just it when it's directly attached, not for a post-surgery, but a fresh <clears throat> virgin muscle, you can cut a little more to get a small amount. But yes, peripheral uh, tenotomy, not the central one. Because many a times we have muscles that are leave with a central sag. I don't really think the central sag over time really makes so much of a difference. I, of course, they must be influencing. So that's why a central tenotomy, I don't have any personal experience about how much they really cause an effect. But yeah, the mini plications I have done, I mean, for about five to eight prisms of extra effect that you want, then you can do a mini plication described uh, again by, uh, uh, I think uh, that's a good thing that you can do. Uh, you I can do a five millimeter away from the insertion a bite of the, uh, and then pass it just like in the plications, but this is a single suture in the center and that is going to tighten it by five or eight prisms. So as a extra procedure, Mini plication is a, a good technique for strengthening. Um, okay. Um, Ma'am, there's a question from Dr. Apinasha Parke uh, yeah. on the Zoom portal. But she wants to know that when do you do the final adjustment, the adjustable sutures, especially if the patient has been operated under peribulbar anesthesia? So in case of my ad, uh, adjustments, I usually do it under GA. So my post GA about once the patient is out of anesthesia, about half an hour later, I adjust at the same time. So I check the patient post uh, uh, GA after half an hour, I check it. And then under topical, I suture it on do. So I don't have an experience of peribulbar. Dr. Sharma, about you, because I do yeah, all I think, the cases. Um, many a times we are, uh, we do not have the easy luxury of GA. So uh, for adults, we are not using GA. So, and many of the time children, when we're using GA, they may not be cooperative or adjustable. So I think uh, doing, a, they may require a two GA. Like I have seen Dr. Uh, McNear doing this sequential GA with the gap of just half an hour. He would do one procedure under GA and then roll the patient outside and then get him back 
uh, after seeing when, once he was out of GA and the full uh, sensation had come, and then take him again in the GA. So that was his technique of using two, two GAs. Uh, but the technique which I learned from Dr. Rosenbaum was using even for top, uh, you can do it under uh, peribulb, but uh, you can do two uh, different techniques. One is after five or six hours, which Dr. Eisenberg would do after doing a, a peribulb block, or you may do it after 24 hours. That means uh, uh, on the next day morning. So th these are the two ways that you can adjust. I mean, but beyond this, it's very difficult because adhesions would have formed. So latest you would do by maybe uh, within uh, 24 hours. Uh, the tip to remember in peribulbar anesthesia is if you want to do it after five to six hours, avoid using sensor cane or you should use only xylocaine because the effect of the sensor cane will last longer. Bupivacaine should be avoided in cases in which you want to do an adjustable per under peribulbar. Uh, the xylocaine will effect will fade away after four hours or maximum six hours and you can schedule the adjustment at six hours interval. But if you have used uh, bupivacaine or a combination of xylocaine with bupivacaine, you would have to defer the adjustment beyond eight hours. As you said, Dr. Guyton also, whom I had visited, would do like this. He would give a GA, and after the patient is out, he would again give a sedation and then uh, do that. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, I just want to say that I've done a little adjustment with the uh, tandem suture technique where, you know, you put two sutures and if you needed to uh, correct it, you knock off one of them. But And that I've done in, in, uh, in peribulba, I would operate. And then later in the evening in the ward at the stit lamp, I mean, after checking out the patient, and if you needed to uh, cut off the suture under, under topical, I would do that in the evening under topical. Yeah. So one more thing that we, uh, which I learned from Dr. Raniki was a single stage adjustable surgery. So that is basically like working under topical anesthesia. Uh, the patient is under IV sedation using midazolam and fentanyl. And you just use uh, uh, paracaine as a, an anesthetic agent. And you can work uh, in what he taught us was that you should have a, on the ceiling a cross marked so that the patient can see intraoperatively so because the patient is under topical anesthesia, the moment he's a little lighter of the sedation, you ask him to look up and see for the uh, deviation. So it's an intraoperative adjustment and the sort of topical anesthesia with the help of IV sedation only. So this we had done uh, as a, a project and in intermittent exotropias, and that we had published in IGO also, a single stage adjustable surgery compared with a double stage adjustable surgery. Two stages. So, 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 just want to know, okay, with this adjustment, did your outcomes become better compared to other normally doing? Uh, for it, basically, it's an adjustment, so it will definitely have a little advantage over no adjustments. So, what we found was that if you do not do an adjustment, you get about eighty-five percent correct chances of uh, good correction. Fifteen percent, you will be having maybe ten percent under and five percent over corrections. With the uh, two-stage technique, we got about 95% correction. Okay. With the single-stage adjustable, actually, we got a little more over-corrections. The reason was that one of the muscles uh, was usually having some anesthesia effect even with the topical deformed. Okay. Particularly, the lateral lectus is, I think, more sensitive. So that gets anesthetized more. And you may have a leftover ESO. You may think that you uh, still have a ESO and you may do a little more correction. So that can be a little bit of uh, aberration. So, so we have done, uh, I mean, I've done a series of such cases where uh, even in my uh, squint clinic, we had stuck the uh, stellar chart, in fact, an E chart on the roof so that we got the patient to understand that this is the experience he or she would have in the OT. Uh, you know, and but that also involved that, uh, especially if you have a corrective glasses, that the glasses also need to be for, in, in formal and so everything has to be changed. We, we made a special drape where the other eye could also be open, you know, both both would be cleaned so that we could, you know, uh, get the glasses on and do a kind of a cover test and have the ceiling uh, exposure done there. And most of us, I mean, I stopped doing it because I really didn't find much difference in the outcome when I compared to my historical controls where we were not doing this uh, per operative adjustment. And because it, it is so tedious and there are pressures in the OT, one tends to come back to their regular routine more or less most of the time. Right. So even the two-stage adjustable, we do uh, less often than what we would like to because we find that we get a fairly good correction and many a times the patients are uh, going to be happy without a two-stage surgery. But there are certain indications 
like very critical patients who are going to be very troublesome if they have even the slightest diplopia and they in in the initial post op period also especially the paralytic strabismus cases which have diplopia or as dr jyoti mentioned thyroid cases in which there will be a problem because they are restrict uh, already uh, restrictive muscles i mean already fibrous muscles so their elasticity is poor and that doesn't take up uh, the post op uh, deviations as nicely as the elastic muscles otherwise would do so in those cases i think adjustable surgery is usually the preferred technique but otherwise many a times we are getting away with non adjustable right uh thank you jyoti ma'am thank you pradeep sir thank you amitabh sir for this wonderful session and i'm really enjoying the strabismus sessions here for me everything is a lot more new than you can imagine so uh we have with us the next session that is uh, on october 21st recent advances in strabismus by dr vivek varkar sir and uh, thank you all of our, all of you for sparing your time uh, pradeep sir would you like to say something no i think i am really uh, very happy to see all these uh, sessions going on so uh, well and dr jyoti particularly has taken lot of pains to get all these videos available for uh, the common as well as the less common procedures so really uh, uh, thank you dr jyoti for having this wonderful exposition and thank you dr amitava for uh, co chairing with me and dr rolika for being a, such a nice host and uh, moderating this session thank you all and thank, thank all so the much. uh audience who are live and the hot seat people the we have so many today <laughs> really wonderful thank you all wonderful. thank, thank you. you so much